Hello and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we have some more custom tools. We have a little sneaky look at that production privy downhill bike, the CNC machined one. There's a new bike from Propane and we have, uh, in fact, we're not gonna do the quiz, but we are gonna bring in Rewind Top Mods and some Bike Cave action with some wicked stuff from you lot. Okay, so let's roll into this week's show. And kind of what I wanna talk about today is, are you overbiked? Now this is something, yeah, it comes up quite a lot, but I just want to tell you about what happened to me the weekend. So I was riding through a local section of wood, pretty, pretty rocky, rooty, pretty janky and horrible, to be fair. Now, arguably, on a bigger travel bike, when you're smashing through this, yeah, it does feel really good, but any other time, a short travel bike is always going to feel better because of the fact you have to, you're, you're more engaged with the terrain. Now, the rider in front of me, they were cruising along, I'd say, so they could have been tired, they might have been two thirds for a really long ride. But I did see the body language suggested to me that they might not have been riding for that long, as in they've only just come into mountain biking, or perhaps they just hadn't developed the skills yet to, to ride more aggressively. But it was the bike that caught me out. So they were on a YT Capra, the, the sort of the gray, silvery gray and dark gray, the two-tone one with the Fox uh, 36 on the front, I think like a 170 travel, 29, you know, super slack, like monster truck of a bike, 29 inch wheels. And they pretty much were riding it like a passenger. Now, I've seen this ride around a few times and they've bought a beautiful bike, like make no mistakes, but I sometimes made me wonder if they'd bought the wrong bike for them. Uh, because of the fact I see them, granted, you know, just take it on this story because they might ride all over the world and they're just stuck here in lockdown. But um, but my point is that bike looked like they were holding, the bike looked like it was holding the rider up. I was riding my 100 mil travel cross country bike, which was almost a little bit phased actually by the terrain. Uh, the tires are scratching for grip. You're kind of hopping over those awkward routes across the trail and, you know, basically having to really work and massage the terrain to just stay upright and go forwards. But I love that. I live for that feeling. I, I want to feel my ride and I want, I want to feel the terrain. I want to feel that feedback from the ground because it lets me know when I've done something wrong and it feels great when you've done something right. I couldn't help but feeling that this guy was just a bit of a passenger pedaling 170 mil travel bike through some what would what must have felt like a pretty average woodland and i really hope that's not the case so i just want to ask the question to everyone out there does do you think your bike if you've got a bigger travel bike do you think it might be too too big for you um honest question here because all the marketing that all the companies will tell you is oh yeah you need a slacker head angle you need a longer wheelbase you need 29 inch wheels so you can monster truck over those rocks and don't worry because our bike with our unique pedaling platform will get you back up to the top no problem now that's great and those bikes pretty much all do that stuff but they can still make like average terrain boring and mountain biking is supposed to be fun. You're supposed to go out and feel the exhilaration. You're supposed to go out and feel a bit out of control and a bit wild on every ride. And you're supposed to go out and be at one with that terrain to really sort of feel it. You know, you can't ride to the ability of the bike unless you're like, you know, you can feel the tires scratching for grip and you can feel all that sensation. Now, a much faster rider or a better rider can arguably get those feelings from a bigger travel bike because they're hitting things so much harder. But if you're not one of those star riders, I mean, it's one of the reasons I don't ride a bigger travel bike. So I feel like there's nowhere locally, certainly, that I would be able to push one. Um, very few people would be locally, to be fair. But but most places, you know, if it's exceptionally rough or somewhere that's a bit more fun, yeah, I'd be inclined to take a bigger bike. But for most stuff, you don't need it, and I don't need it. Um, so are you, do you fall into the camp if you've got a little bit less travel on your bike and your bike sort of, you know, lets you know when you've, you've cocked up a bit? Would you want a bike with more travel? Um, and is that to get you around stuff like that? And then the other way around, are you on a bike that's got loads of suspension travel and do you feel like, um, do you feel like you use it properly or do you feel like basically it holds you back or maybe it sort of uh, deadens the terrain slightly? Genuinely interested to know because you know me, I'm always fighting for that sort of the 29L 120 bike is kind of my optimum area, but of course that's not everyone. So I just wanna know where you are, who's riding what, what is your favorite setup? Is it good enough for you? Is it too much? Have you got friends that sound like the person I described? Um, you know, don't get me wrong, like buy what you want. 
and enjoy it. That's great. That's what mountain biking is all about, or any cycling for that matter. But if your bike is holding you back and you might not realize it, you're missing out on a whole world of amazing fun. And if your trails, like my local ones, don't always demand a big travel bike and you've got one, you're definitely missing out. Some of the best rides I've had locally are the ones I've been almost out of control most of the ride. And at the time, you feel like it's crisis management, but it's only afterwards you realize how much fun you've actually had. Honestly, it's the best fun being out of control. But um, hey, uh, let us know anyway in those comments. Okay, so now into news and let's see what's been going on in the world of tech. Right, so what we got first. Okay, so the new propane Eugene. So actually they've had this bike out before, but this is the new revised one. So this is it on screen. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Do you know what? I've never ridden a propane. I really quite like to. I think they're starting to look really, I mean, they've always looked good, but like they're really starting to appeal to me. Um, it might not to you, but hey, so this is it on screen. So it's an all mountain frame made from full carbon. It's got internal cable channels in there. So another manufacturer adopting the, the fact that it's just easier to thread your hoses straight in and pop them out the other end. Brilliant. Starting to like internal cable routing these days. So thank you to any manufacturers that do this. Uh, 29 inch wheels, 140 mil travel front and rear. Uh, there's also a 150 mil fork option on this. They've got those dirt shields on the bearings. So that alone is a reason for people in the UK to like these bikes. It's got an extra seal on top of the bearing. So an extra barrier to stop like muck and stuff just getting into your bearings. Brilliant stuff. Now it's got a really quite a unique ISCG mount. So this is it on screen. Now instead of bolting onto the frame or actually sort of being part of the frame, in which case either method is susceptible to damage arguably, if you're sumping out and smashing stuff. Um, this one is actually plugged onto the frame itself. And it's like, um, they haven't said how, it could be like an interference fit. But the point is it's plugged onto the frame. So it keeps your device in place, but it does, it does mean if your frame's smashed, it spreads out that load, so it's not gonna get damaged, and they're available separately as a replacement part should you damage it. So for the racers out there, I think this sounds like a really good, good idea for the product. Okay, so, uh, well, surprise, surprise, like all new bikes, it's got a steeper seat angle, it's got a slacker head angle, and it's got longer reach. So chain stays on the back of 445, head angle is 65 and a half, very nice, um, not too slack just about right there. 76 and a half degree C angle, uh, reach from 430 to 505, that's with the 140 fork. Uh, very slightly shorter with the 150 fork, as you'd imagine, because further away your head tube gets, the more it changes that geometry. Now, what else have they got on there? So it's got 110% anti-squat, which is, I don't know what the previous one had, I think I've had 100% anti-squat, so this thing is like really good for climbing. Now, the thing about anti-squat is if you add too much anti-squat onto a bike, yes, it can feel incredible for climbing, but the downside is it can make your suspension lack in a bit of sensitivity. Now, I've told you this before about several other manufacturers, including Nukeproof, that put that basically the higher anti-squat value in the lower gears and the opposite in the higher gears. So in your lower gear, uh, gear in your lower gear when you're climbing, it gives you the support as the platform basically. You're pedaling and it's resisting squatting. So that is what you want. But you don't want that much anti-squat when you're descending, like the high speed gears, basically your higher gears, which means the smaller gears, physically smaller gears on the block because of the fact you're descending when you're at that speed and you want all of the grip and traction as possible to sort of reduce the chatter. Now it's interesting that they say that, um, that their one actually is very sensitive. So I'm guessing that they've done exactly the same on that design. So uh, it's a really important thing to suggest there. So it's got massive amounts of anti-squat, but it's still sensitive. So good feature there. And they're another brand that's adopting the SRAM Universal Derailleur Hanger. Brilliant, keep at it. Everyone else, come on, get with the program the universal derailleur hanger. There should only be one derailleur hanger because it's just such a nightmare, such a waste of resource. Uh, I get it, the, there's so many bikes out there that we're gonna need to keep these things. Um, arguably keeping them out in production to make sure they, they're kept for, but in future, wouldn't it be great if oh, I've broken my derailleur hanger? Go to the bike shop, cut the derailleur hanger. There it is, put it on, go, sorted. Um, Colorways, so Safari, petrol and carbon. So the carbon's like a raw finish. The petrol is a bluey, bluey finish and Safari is kind of like an off-white or a sort of a beige sort of colour. It sounds a bit like an old person sports jacket to me but I love it. I think it looks really nice. Maybe I'm of the age where a beige sports jacket is what I want. I don't know but uh, I think it, I think this is the best looking one myself. Uh, I know a lot of you still want to go with a full blacked out thing and some of you want to go with a cool petrol look but uh, I'd have the Safari any day. I think it looks awesome. Um, so what else? 
Um, pricing from 3,339 euros all the way up to 7,164. Now they are the European prices. Currently we do not have UK prices. Uh, I don't have US prices either. Now if the UK, there's, the prices will vary of course with import duty, just like it would if you're buying something from the States. The tariffs have not been confirmed yet. So uh, there will be more details to follow on that. But they're really nice looking bikes and I love the frame layout. I love how sort of compact everything looks, the way the, the shock is are in line with the seat tube there. It's all down, down that sort of bottom bracket part of the bike, leaving the front end to look even longer than it, you know, it, it's a long front end anyway, but it looks long and slender. Bottle cage mount, it's also got the, your tool mount above that on the underside of the top tube. Super clean looking, really, really like it. Uh, yeah, what do you think of that? Okay, so I don't have too many details on the next thing, but given the fact that Forestel bikes are something that our friends over at EMBN talk about all the time because they're, they're attempting to do the impossible basically and do everything in-house. So they're based in Andorra. Uh, you might have seen the Cedric Grass has got a lot to do with them. But they're also essentially partners with Production Privy. As far as I know, that they they either bought the brand or they they paired like partnered with them. Production Privy are made in Andorra, and they've got this new downhill bike. So this is it on screen right now. And look at the thing; it looks unbelievable. So it's a CNC machined bike, which is a very it's a bit of a departure for Production Privy because they're quite known for doing steel frames actually. So. A real cool approach, it's in two parts, it's welded down the middle, so a bit different to the approach we've seen with the Polo bias, which are bonded, and some of the other off offerings on the market, but nonetheless, it's a CNC machine downhill bike, and this thing looks absolutely rad. Now, a few more shots of it on screen here. Um, not a lot else to say at the moment, other than the fact it is the Forest of Design team that are actually behind this bike, and it's, of course, manufactured in their facility in Andorra. I'd absolutely love to get out there. I know that Jonesy from EMBN is going to see those guys at some point. I think I might have to tag on for that trip because seeing an all-in-one production facility is making motors and stuff as well. I think this is fascinating stuff. And production privy in the same house, double whammy. I think it's a cool bike and you're going to see some more stuff coming from them. Okay, what's next? Oakley Mask 3 or MSK3. It's a, basically a tech face mask. We all need face masks, unfortunately, in this day and age. Um, it's part of our, our hygiene and safety, really. So this one is designed to work with sunglasses. It's a bit more tech because it's Oakley. So it has two filter options with it. One that's just a general sort of antibacterial one that's good for pollen and dust and other things that will give you allergies. And the other one actually is the N95. So that's got, it, it filters out uh, particles down to 0.3 microns, 95% um, of those as well. So it qualifies to be an N95. Now there's two types of N95. You get ones like this and you get the other ones that you see a lot of uh, construction workers have that have the valve on the front. Now those ones you can't use as a COVID safe mask because of the fact that they emit droplets. The whole point of them is the valve lets moisture out. That's not what you want. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not going to stop, uh, just like a lot of these masks, it's not going to stop um, that virus getting in, but it's significantly, uh, significantly going to reduce the chances, I've not had enough coffee today, of, of it getting in because we do know that the virus actually sticks to water droplets and stuff on a smaller level. So yes, it is going to give you some kind of barrier along with social distancing and all of the other things. So it's not a bad thing. I think it looks really cool. It's got a bit of a tech look. 50 quid though, fairly spendy as far as masks go, but I think it's pretty good. But I like the fact it's designed to wear sunglasses, but I do have a question that's not been answered anywhere. Does it stop your glasses fogging up? My wife wears glasses, every time she wears a mask, they fog up with all of them. She's tried them all. So I might have to try one of these to see if that is the answer. Uh, and I'm sure it might be an issue for some of you watching out there as well. But uh, I would expect it being Oakley, I'd have high expectations in fact, for you to be able to wear glasses and them not fogging up. But um, well, we shall see. Okay, another cool bit of news, this time from Etnies. So the BMX and skate influence brand have got another pair of mountain bikes or of AIM shoes. In fact, these ones are for mountain biking. This is them on screen. They're called the Colvert Mid. So a mid shoe, kind of like a half cab style shoe in height, supportive strap around the top. So you've got crank protection on them. You've got the strap for retention and security in there. These ones have a Michelin rubber sole on. They're designed for flat pedals. Uh, they look really good. And just looking through the post here on Instagram, couldn't find much out 
anywhere else, it does suggest that they've got a clipless version coming. So keep an eye on that. Uh, follow Etni's bike on Instagram and you might see some more updates coming soon. But uh, I think these look really smart. I do like the fact that some of these skate brands are now sort of moving into sort of mountain biking. It feels like it's a bit more of an accepted sport now. Uh, what do you think about that? Okay, so next up is, um, well actually, last week's show we were talking about some custom tools. And in particular, I posted this picture from uh, Toolbox Wars, who had like a concept of a, a basically a custom hammer they were having made and finished by titanium, uh, titanium finishes, basically. Now, it did look cool, but you can never, never tell exactly how it's gonna look, but this is the finished item. How cool is this? I absolutely have to get something made or finished like this. I think it looks phenomenal. I want, I want one for myself. I don't know what exactly yet. I'll figure that out. But in the process of looking at this, I saw these Nipex pliers online. Now, if you don't know about the Nipex locking pliers, you're missing out. Those that know, no. They're one of the things that you have. In fact, I've got a pair here. They're one of my favorite tools for working on absolutely anything. They're locking pliers. You can use these on fork top caps. You can use them on a number of things. They're just super useful to have something that is adjustable, especially when you're limited on what you can carry with you and what you can do. Now we know that a lot of the pro mechanics carry those in their toolkits, but look at these again. So these ones have got laser etching on them. They're by EDC Outlaw, producing some really cool stuff. Again, I've already got a pair of those, but N plus one with tools kind of like hammers and wrenches and stuff. Would you have custom tools? Do you think it's a step too far? Um, is it just for crazy geeks? Uh, I love them. I'm all in for this stuff. I think it's really cool. Um, let one of the price decide, considering the price of them in the first place, I think I paid about 40 quid, maybe 45 quid for those. So, you know, they're $75. You're buying them custom, but it's custom, right? You're not gonna see many more of them. Hmm. Does anyone remember Sprindex? Now, we were talking about these, I forget what show, so so long ago, actually, I'd completely forgotten. Core springs, you could adjust the spring weight, so don't confuse that with adjusting preload. Preload will not change the spring rate. It will just uh, fractionally alter the force it requires uh, to start the movement of the shock, basically. So you would put preload on if you're in the right ballpark for the spring, and you just want it to not react instantaneously to your pedaling, for example. Now, Sprindex make an adjustable spring rate. It's got like a, it's like a ratchet system on, on the bottom of the spring. I'd completely forgotten until TF Tune posted this up. Now it's really cool. So they only, I know for a fact, they only stock things that they actually believe in. Like the staff there are passionate, doesn't come close to what they do. They live and breathe suspension. And the fact they posted this, in fact, just read it yourself on screen. I love it. They've dyno tested them and they're waxing lyrical about them. So. Um, I'm going to ask, I think I'm going to ask Finn uh, to build me a shock because he's got some old shock bodies and he's got some stuff lying around. I reckon he can build me a pretty kick-ass shock um, from, from what he's got lying around, which would be a really cool approach instead of just getting a shock, um, you know, off, off the shelf, so to speak. And I might see if I can try one of these springs on it because one of the reasons for me not wanting to run a core shock on my mountain bikes is I'm constantly changing my rider weight, as in I might be going with a camera bag, I might be going with just a hip pack, I might be going with nothing, and it's too much of a pain to adjust. Whereas when I got an air shock, obviously it's super easy to chuck in 20 or 30 pounds and go and hit the trails. So actually, could be a good shout, I think. I think these look good. Anyone out there tried them? If you've tried Sprindex, let us know what you think in those comments. Now, if you're looking for a cool Instagram page to follow, check out Wheelbased. Now, I actually saw this this post, in fact, with the uh, Yeti rear derailleur pop up. And I was like, what the hell is that? Yeah, so the crew behind Wheelbased researched what's going on online. They've got a website as well. In fact, the link to their website is at the bottom of the page right now. And it's also in the description underneath. Check out what they're putting out. It's some really cool content. They're looking at patents that exist for mountain biking components, past, present, and some that might be in the future, like this one from Yeti. Uh, it's a patent that goes back to 2018, but it's for a, what do they call it? A, it's a six, basically a six bar, from what you can work out, a six bar rear derailleur. A six R linkage, it looks very different. It's, it's said to be smaller and lighter or can make a smaller and lighter rear derailleur. Hopefully that's good because you can get it out of the way. Looking at a derailleur down here for ideas. Yeah, because they're already quite exposed. If you can make them smaller and lighter and still achieve the same thing, hey, I'm in. Um, 
Where is it, Yeti? <laughs> What's going on with it? Awesome page to follow, loads of other cool stuff on there. Uh, there's this really cool post here about this uh, Canada scalpel with the chain stays. There's another cool one about a specialized tubeless valve system. That looks a bit different. Really interesting stuff. If you want to nerd out, check them out. Wicked stuff, keep it up. Okay, so back into comments then. So first up is from Matt Rance. I'm hearing White have sold out most of their bikes till 2022, which seems ridiculous. Why is it they sell out of bikes and not manufacture more to supply the demand? Well, the reason is they're working a couple of years ahead and no one could foresee, no one could foresee what was going to happen with the coronavirus and the pandemic. Supply chains completely shutting down. The demand far basically exceeded um, what people actually had, what people had forecast. You couldn't possibly forecast what was going to happen. Uh, this is the same. I want to stand up for white. It'd be the same for any brands out there. I really feel sorry for them because all bike brands will be firefighting like crazy to get this, get these things kicking again. So yeah, it's really annoying for you, unfortunately, but uh, probably more annoying for them as well because they could have made twice the amount of bikes, probably three times the amount of bikes and sold them if they had a crystal ball. Uh, ben Fairbrother, Dotty, more on the bike stock problems. Polygon make bikes for many companies like Caliber. They've had some leftover frames from Caliber as well as parts. From these frames, they've released the Polygon Vanda range. They have a focus on value and are made to get new riders sick bikes. Brilliant. Uh, due to the fact they're using spare parts, these frames are available to be bought now, uh, making them pretty cool and rare. Yeah, that, that's absolutely brilliant. Kind of reminds me a little bit about Mountain Mayhem, which I referred to. That's just a, a chain of shops. They basically bought loads of warranty frames and built them up with stuff that they had and sold them as complete bikes just to get around the supply issue themselves. Brilliant stuff. December 21, I was eyeing a Trek Remedy for eight weeks, out of stock everywhere. I managed to uh, nab the last medium one I had in stock. Two weeks later, Trek put the prices up 350 quid. Lucky me. Yeah, perfect example. Like, if you see it right now, buy it, basically. Otherwise, you might want to just wait a bit. Uh, Martin Oin. In two or three years, the second-hand bike market will be great when all the people who've only got into biking due to COVID get bored and sell them. Do you know what? It's actually really good now as well. Like, it's a great time to buy a bike because there's just so much stuff out there. Although, you do have to be careful in a second-hand market and you've got to know what the thing is worth when you're buying it because some people are hiking up prices because of the demand thing. Uh, next one from uh, Why Not 64928 Found them. The containers, that is. They're clogging up the waterfront in Auckland, New Zealand. Well, it also sounds like they're clogging up the uh, around Sydney and also near Southampton in the UK and various other places. So I'm imagining that this is a problem absolutely everywhere because the ships are so desperate to get in and get the stuff off. They're going out without packing them full of uh, shipping containers. Maybe I should start a shipping company specifically to ship empty containers back to Asia. Hmm. Dodge Transport. It's got a good ring to it, isn't it? Hold on. That already exists, I'm pretty sure. Uh, next up, on the throttle, bike shop manager here. 2020 was a great year for cycling as a whole, but we're paying the price for it now. Every manufacturer we stock, and some we usually don't, have placed our entire 2021 pre-orders with. Um, we, we have to, otherwise we won't have anything to sell come June. Imagine in the next month or two, 2022 orders will have to start, otherwise we'll miss out on that as well. Uh, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. It's great the demand is so high, but sad the prices are going up all round as it limits people that can access cycling. It's not like wages that go up with inflation. As Doddy said, uh, if you see a bike, buy it or risk being disappointed. I might put the first six minutes of this video in loop in the store. Uh, yeah, it's sad but true, isn't it? But uh, hey, if you're looking to get a bike right now, good luck. Um, hope you get what you want. All right, now it's time for Rewind. I get to talk about old stuff. I love this bit of the show. Uh, if you've got anything old, let us know. Um, there's a link right there on the, on the screen and there's another link you can click, click on and takes you through to Uploader. Now, I want to just show you a few cool things that my dad dragged out and dropped on the doorstep. So this is all stuff that I'd, I'd forgotten about. So I think I referred to the Brand Score Bash recently. This is one of my first ever proper decent bike races. Dorset Rough Riders Brand Score Bash, August 1992. Love that race. And then uh, MBI Winter Series for 92 and 93. There's a few plates, but the other ones are so muddy you can't actually see them. In fact, if you have a look at the back of this, you'll, you'll see just how muddy. Uh, that was probably in Brentwood Park in Essex or somewhere horrible like that. But uh, that's what I grew up doing races of these. Andrew Dodd, Youth Mail, number 352. Mountain Biker International Winter Series. I love it, it's like bringing back old memories. And this one actually, Mulvins, I did the 92 as well, but Mulvins Classic 1993. That was just like, I think that was when the penny dropped because all of these little chipper races I used to do, you'd go around, you'd see some other mountain bikers, it'd be muddy and cold and you'd 
do stuff. But when I went to the Malverns, that was going to a festival. Have you, has everyone here been to a festival? Is a music festival or whatever? You know, that first time you get there, you're like, oh my God, there's like thousands of people the same as me here. This is like the coolest thing ever. That's how I felt when I went to the Malverns in 93. And I really hope that's what I feel again when I go to Malverns this year, because uh, that's going to be a really good party. So. 1903, very cool stuff. Another one, Southern Downhill from 99. Don't even know where that was. Could have been Aston Hill, could have been anywhere. And my universal spoke length equation that was on the uh, workshop wall at the bike shop I used to work at. Pretty handy stuff there. Park Tool Catalog for 1999. And also, actually, this, the Park TP number no. two. It's a toilet paper holder, and they called it the TP number no. two. Get it? <laughs> yeah, it's good, isn't it? Check it out. They don't make these anymore. I kind of wish they did. It's really cool. So it's basically a head tube plate of a bike with a real headset on it. And um, when you change the fork quick release, basically you can uh, put your to toilet roll on it with a mini fork. Now, I used to know of a few people that would take this off and put full-size forks on in their bike workshops. Has anyone got one of these lying around? I'd love to see how you use it, because I'm considering trying to adapt this slightly, uh, basically make a new fork for it, so I can fit shop towel on it, because that would make an awesome holder for shop towel. And Calvin or Eric from Park Tool, if you're watching this, or Truman or any other cool people from Park, why don't make these for shop towel now? <laughs> They're so good. Put a tapered head you went there, keep it up to date, yeah? Nice stuff. Okay, so one more cool old thing I want to show you. In fact, it's, the, it's only the coolest old thing there is. Now, this has been sent to me by GC Retro Tech Shop with along with a bunch of stickers. Yeah. The Tioga Disk Drive, the Pro version. So there's two versions of these that were around in the 90s. The regular one was blue and had the, the Kevlar geodesic webbing that was basically bonded onto it. This one is basically just raw geodesic webbing and had a plastic case bonded on the top. Now, if you look up close to this, you can see it's got like what's sort of powder. Um, you obviously wouldn't have seen that to start with because that's the glue that's obviously just perished over the years. I had a really cool noise. And if you're even wondering what on earth this is, it doesn't have spokes. You have these Kevlar cords, yeah, known as geodesic webbing, um, that replaces them. So it enables the rim to flex very slightly. We're talking a very small amount here, but it actually gave the rear end of your bike quite an absorbent feel and an amazing noise. Um, I can't bash this one on the floor because it has got an inner tube in it and I wouldn't do that because something's so old anyway. But if anyone out there used to have one of these or you have any footage, please share it with us because the noise of this, people need to hear what it sounded like. They just sounded absolutely amazing. And it's kind of hilarious actually that these were even considered for mountain bikes. I mean, I guess it came from the road bike world where it's all about aerodynamics, but uh, when these came to mountain biking, even to start with, they're actually like hen's teeth because they were so expensive, no one wanted to buy them. And those that bought them basically would suck them all up because you'd end up breaking them, putting your foot through them, all sorts of stuff. But it just, it's just such a thing of beauty. I absolutely love it. Classic old Onza Racing Porcupine tires, 2.1 Kevlar bead on those. And they don't even feel that perished. These feel like really good condition, which is outstanding. So this is a tire that's been re-released recently, although it looks nothing like this, just shares the same name. Uh, it comes in white, of course. And it's got a Mavic on here. Which one is this? So it's a 231 CD. So the CD is this sort of gray finish. You get the silver ones or the CD finish. Absolutely beautiful. Lovely, lovely bit at this. Uh, and it's an XCR hub on the inside there as well. So, uh, and this, in case you're wondering why I've even got this, um, I'm not building this on a bike. This was just lent to me by GT Retro Tech Shop. So I'm about to film a video about cool and strange bike tech from over the years. The good, the bad, and the ugly. There's gonna be some old stuff in there. There's gonna be some new stuff in there. And there's gonna be some stuff that, well, let's face it, just shouldn't exist. And uh, look out for that video coming soon on GMB and Tech. And don't forget, if you've got anything cool, old and retro, let's see it. Put your money where your mouth is. We love this stuff. We talk about it all day long. Get your entries in soon. All right, now let's find out what you've been up to in top mods. Now this is a section of the show where we talk about the modifications you've done to your bike. All those little things, all the large things you've done to make your bike a bit different, a bit better, better any of that stuff. Uh, if you've done anything cool to your bike, show us. There's a link right here. There's a better one in the description underneath this video. Click on it. it takes you through to the uploader and you can tell us all about your bike. 
Now, I've got to confess, the title of this one made me look at it. <laughs> it was called Beer Bike. <laughs> so this one's from Alex in Watford. I used to go to college in Watford, at West Hearts. I used to go to the club there. I can't even remember what it used to be called outside the pond. Um, it was pretty terrible, but um, hey, we were probably, uh, we might have even been underage getting served in there. Who knows? Might not have said that. But uh, hey, so 2017 Cannondale Habit. I bought a secondhand um, habit and built it using the parts of my hardtail. The blue paint was tired, so I designed a little logo based on barley and hops. I'm a brewer, nice stuff. And I made some stencils. I used spray paint, bike paints. Couldn't be, be happy with how it turned out. Head tube badge is awesome. You could have entered that in head tube badge thing recently. That looks really cool. Love it. Carpe diem, yeah, very nice. Oh, you've even got a, a bottle top on, on your stem as well. How did you get that mounted on there? Because I have seen uh, some people make a top cap. I can't tell you who, because I can't remember. If anyone knows, uh, you can use beer bottles as a beer bottle tops to go on your top cap. If anyone knows what that product is, tell me, because I'd quite like one myself. Yeah, love it, you've done a really good finish on that. Looking awesome. Nice stuff. A pair of Onza tires on there too. And in fact, a pair, a single one, the Ibex on the rear, quite similar to a high roller. Not a bad thing. And up front, the Schwalbe Magic Mary. Hey, that looks really good, you've got a great finish on that. Okay, next up is, um, well, what can only be described as a fleet of bikes from Cameron. Um, they're all just gonna be coming up on screen now. There's there's loads of cool stuff here. So there's a YT Capra 2016 Pro Race, a Kingdom Vendetta X2, and a Forbidden Druid. Right now, I'm looking at the shot of the Forbidden Druid. It's, it's awesome. That's a proper witchcraft bike, isn't it? Or so they say. Anyway, it's a high pivot bike using an idler wheel to chain routing over the top. I think it's only got like two or three extra links on that chain from a full length one. Um, so not as much as you might think you'd need to have a, a big roof chain like that. Essentially, you've got the benefit of a big rearward axle path, so it eats up bigger bumps, but you don't have the problems of chain growth that you would have that's associated with a high pivot because you've got a chain routing over the top of it. So arguably best of both worlds. The idler wheel system though, jury is still out for me. I've not ridden enough to, to tell you how they are, to be fair. Um, but I have heard people saying you can feel a little bit more friction in them, but imagine it's, it will be negligible. If you're running sticky rubber tires, you're probably gonna feel a lot more friction from them than you would from an idler wheel. But hey, the bike looks awesome. So the Kingdom, you've got two sets of wheels on there, 27 and a half plus for snow and winter, and 29s with mud tires on as well. Well, so you properly chop and change between those. A proper winter hardtail. I've upgraded the bars to Kingdom Sparta uh, titanium handlebars, and I'm submitting the head tube badge from the Kingdom into your coolest head tube badges segment. Um, I might have uh, missed that, but we'll have a look at that. Yeah, the Druid is a 40th present to myself at the end of last year. It's got a push 11.6 course. Oh man, you spent some money on that. So not only have you got that wild frame, you've got the 11.6 shock. That's, that shock is insane. It's such a good shock. And um, did your bike choice of bikes really, really nice. Loving those custom graphics you've got as well on the fork. Uh, so they're from Richard Scott Design. Look very cool. It's all like zombie skeleton things bursting out of the forks. Goes with the turf, I guess. Man, what a collection. I'm just gonna get, leave your, your collection firing up on screen. Forbidden looks beautiful with all those extra color-coded choices like the red anodized nipples and the blue jockey wheels, hub detail, bottom bracket shell I can see in there. Graphics on the frame, the hope stem spacers, headset. Yeah, just... Lovely looking bike, there's that shock again. Interesting to see you run the same pedals through all your bikes. I think that's really cool. Making the most of them, they are giving them a bit of a service. That's all good. And there's the YT. That's one of the classics actually, that one. One of the earlier ones. When they first came out, they almost looked too good to be true. Do you remember the adverts that were in Dirt Magazine? Um, I think people were like, really? You know, Can we actually have a bike for this amount of money that doesn't exist yet? Well, we have to pre-order it. That's a new thing. Far ahead of the curve they were. Yeah, brilliant stuff, and there's that beautiful hardtail. Hey, what a collection. And you've done some serious modding on these bikes. They all, they all look completely bespoke for you. I think this is ace. Hey, here's a question for people that could make quite an interesting topic. What do you think is better, custom bikes or off the shelf? I quite like an off the shelf bike. I pretty much would change the bars, pedals, and maybe a tire, but I'm quite happy to run an off the shelf bike. I have no issues. But I know some people, just like your good self, um, that will go the, the whole hog and change absolutely everything all by frame and completely custom spec it. Now, where are you at? Or, or are you even, not even that fussed about it? It's just a bike, you want to ride it? I'd like to know. But uh, yeah, some awesome top mods there for this week. Uh, if you've done some cool stuff to your bikes, 
show and tell. Okay, and last up this week, we're gonna go into Bike Cave, and I'm just looking at a hell of a cave here. Now, Bike Cave is all about your places like this, where you store your bikes. Could be the shed, could be the back of a pickup truck, wherever. Anywhere counts, as long as that's where your bike lives. Uh, sharing with us, let's see what you've made. Uh, I know a lot of people have been working on stuff in lockdown, as I can see right here. So this one says, this is uh, Blake inspired. So Blake over on GMBM made a video building one himself. Uh, this is from Lee in Northwestern Helens. In lockdown 2020, after seeing Blake's project and Dolly's tech shows, I went about building a new bike cave. And mate, you've done it really well. So really good to see a massive heavy duty ground anchor on the floor there, because you've got to look after your stuff. Looks like you've done a lot of OSB sterling board everywhere, vertical bike hooks, always good to see. And yeah, that's very Blake inspired, your little workspace there. Little selection of tools on the tool bar, tool bench thing. Got a computer in the corner. Looking nice, a stack of magazines there for nostalgia. Yeah, got your vice, got a swivel vice like I have. Always nice and useful. And you've got some LED strip lights as well. Yeah, looking good. Very Blake inspired, in fact. I'll have to show him this one. He's, you might have seen it. You, I'm guessing you might have sent this into a GMBN as well. But yeah, looking smart. How many different angles have you got? So you've got another section of it as well. Okay, obviously, so you've got your electricity box or your gas boxes here. Got a helmet shelf, more strip lighting, uh, all your camel backs and stuff there, and even space down the bottom there for some, what looks like a multi-pack of Brewdog beers. Very nice. Okay, next us from Kevin. Nice and cozy in my cave. I live with my wife and two kids in a cottage with no garage. This is my refuge. Storage for all the family bikes and gear, plus tools, workbench, and a bench for getting dressed to ride. I even have a flat screen uh, space to pull out the rollers and watch GMBM videos. Hey, it looks awesome. So you've got your guitars in here as well. Hey, look, where on earth is this built? It looks like you've built it on the side of a cliff or something with all the rock in there. Um, interesting stuff, looks cool. Great use of the space as well. Uh, a few more angles of it here. So yeah, got the bikes wedged in there, loads of good stuff there. Hey, it's great, you've made great use of that space. Yeah, I like the workbench as well. Nice and compact to the back, nothing getting in the way. And I love that old T-handle park tool there. You've had that from, uh, from the 90s. Good bit of kit, I've got one of those. And there's all your riding bags next to the guitars. Nice work. Hey, really enjoyed looking through all your content this week. The quiz will return next week. I just wanted to give a bit more time to the Rewind, Bike Cave and Top Mod sections. Honestly, love seeing what you've all been up to. So keep us up to date with everything you're doing and we'll see you on next week's show. See you later.